Good evening and welcome to tonight's program, The Story of Latinos in Kansas City. My name is Mark Livingood, director of the Story Center at Mid-Continent Public Library. For the next year, the Story Center is partnering with the University of Missouri Extension's Community Arts Program to offer a series of unique programs that commemorate the Missouri Bicentennial. Called State of Stories, this series of free public programs features storytelling performances and workshops, book conversations, and humanities programs like tonight's program that explore the history and culture of the Show Me State. Funding has been provided in part by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Sandra Enriquez, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where she also directs the public history emphasis. Professor Enriquez earned her PhD from the University of Houston and is a social historian of modern United States history with particular research and teaching interests in Chicanx and Latinx history, urban history, borderlands, social movements, and public history. She is currently working on a manuscript that examines the grassroots preservation efforts of Mexican-American neighborhoods in El Paso. And in Kansas City, she directs the Latinx Casey Oral History Project and is the co-editor of a forthcoming digital project on Kansas City activism. Dr. Enriquez, welcome. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. I'm really uh, excited to be able to share a few stories with you tonight. Uh, and I first and foremost want to say happy Latinx or uh, Hispanic Heritage Month to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight and to, you know, kind of share a glimpse of, of Kansas City's rich uh, Latino history with you. Uh, but thank you again for being, uh, for joining us today. And thank you uh, to Dr. Michael Ivangood and the Story Center and the Mid-Continent uh, Mid -Continent Library for having me as part of this conversation as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the way that I'm going to do this is I will share a few stories um, and then uh, maybe have any questions that pop up as the stories come, uh, you know, feel free to share them uh, through the comment section um, and I will get to those uh, towards the end. So I'll probably present for around 30, 35 minutes um, and then have the the floor the virtual floor open for questions uh, that you can share on the comments um, so i am sure that at least somewhere you've heard that the latino population is the fastest growing demographic in the united states uh, today the group comprises about 18.5 percent of the population making it the largest minority uh, group in the country the Kansas City, Missouri, or the Kansas City metro area altogether uh, reflects similar uh, growth patterns uh, in the population. Uh, according to estimates from the U.S. Census in 2019, uh, Latinos comprise 10% 10.2% uh, of the population of Kansas City, uh, Missouri, uh, and 9.2% uh, of Jackson County, Missouri's population. On the Kansas City, Kansas side. Uh, that um, is that number, uh, along with the number of Wyandotte County, is 29.9%. Uh, uh, and even the Latino population is growing in suburban areas and in spaces where this population was not necessarily uh, deemed as a as a as a large group. So in places like Johnson County, Latinos are now comprising 7.2% of the population uh, with places like uh, Roland Park with a 7.6% population and Olathe uh, with a population uh, percentage of 11.3%, uh, which has you know, increased from less than 2% in 1990 to you know, 20 years, 30 years later almost, uh, an, an increase uh, to 11.3%. So it is obvious that with this population increase, uh, that the Latinos are becoming more visible, not only in the United States, but in the Kansas City area as well. Uh, we have seen the transformation of neighborhoods like the historic Northwest. We have seen numbers of murals pop up, uh, covering Latino, uh, depicting Latino culture and painted by Latino artists uh, from, from the metro area. Uh, over the last couple of decades, we've seen a rising number of Latino owned businesses. We have also seen numerous organizations that have uh, emerged 
in order to uh, serve and, and address the needs of the growing Latino population in the metro. And many can credit this, uh, this new uh, Latino visibility in the metro area uh, to a wave of newcomers of, of Latino immigrants. However, uh, Latinos have had deep, long historic roots in the area. Uh, historians have often cited that Latinos uh, first traveled through the Santa, Santa Fe Trail and settled in the area um, in the early part of the 19th century. And as Kansas City emerged as an, an industrial and transportation agricultural hub at the turn of the 20th century, uh, it really became an important place uh, for Latinos who were uh, being pulled by the opportunity of jobs uh, anywhere between uh, you know, places along the US-Mexico border to places like Chicago. So Kansas City became an important central place uh, where uh, you know, a Latino community could flourish. Uh, and technically, uh, Kansas City's Latinos uh, literally built Kansas City as they labored uh, arduously in the railroad industry, in the meat packing industries and other industries. Uh, but they've also built lively communities, they fought uh, arduously for civil rights, and they also created spaces and organizations that celebrate their cultural and historic roots. Uh, but this rich Latino history uh, also connects Kansas City to stories of national importance. Uh, I think that myself coming as a, as a newcomer to the Kansas City area, uh, I, when I found out that Kansas City was home to the longest uh, continuously operating uh, organization in the United States and also was the birthplace of the, of the U.S. Uh, Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce, I was kind of blown away because it's in the Midwest. We expect these uh, organizations and these histories to be uh, taking place in places along the Southwest or in places like Los Angeles or San Antonio that have uh, lot larger numbers and longer, um, longer uh, histories of Latinos um, in those spaces. So clearly there's a rich history, but where are these stories? Why are Latinos not represented in the larger narratives of Kansas City when we talk about the local history? Although there have been a few efforts by local archives and other historical organizations and preserving and documenting these stories of, in the, of the Latino past, uh, they still continue to be uh, grossly underrepresented. And so as I came into the Kansas City area, um, as a history professor and as a public historian, I've always had the, the, priority, the priority as a historian to elevate and amplify voices of underrepresented groups. Uh, and as a Mexican-American myself and a Latina historian, um, I knew that we had to engage uh, as um, not my, just myself as a professor and as at UMKC and, and the public history program at UMKC, uh, that we had to uh, create new, greater, and meaningful efforts to document the history of Latinos in the Kansas City area. So I have been very fortunate in my time at UMKC to be able to create public history courses uh, and efforts that serve as a vehicle to really record and document these stories. Uh, and in my four years here, I have been able to work uh, through collaborative projects uh, such as uh, public history exhibits, digital exhibits, and then my ongoing uh, Latinx oral history project in which, you know, in these projects, students, community members, and I have collaborated in the creation and documentation of accessible uh, archival materials and stories that feature local Latino histories. So I'm just going to share a few of them with you uh, to, to offer a small but uh, significant glimpse at the cultural impact and the social impact of how Latinos have shaped uh, Kansas City history, society and culture, but also how these stories connect to our larger understandings of the Latino experience in the Midwest and in the United States. Uh, so usually for communities, uh, for underrepresented communities, community organizations um, always serve as important anchors for a uh, community. Uh, and for the Latino community, perhaps the most important of these organizations was, it is the Guadalupe Centers. Um, and this organization has served the uh, community for over a century now. 
Uh, last year, I was very fortunate to be a part of, uh, of a team of scholars, of community members, and of staff members at the Guadalupe Centers uh, who were charged with the celebration of the organization um, for its centennial uh, commemoration. And so together with my students at UMKC and uh, together with another colleague from UMKC and the community um, stakeholders there uh, from the Guadalupe Centers, we uh, were able to create a physical and a digital exhibit th that tells the story of the Guadalupe Centers uh, from its inception to present day. So as I briefly mentioned earlier, um, the turn of the 20th century was an important um, aspect of Kansas City history. Um, and it coincided with uh, the turmoil of the Mexican Revolution in Mexico. So uh, at this time, it is estimated that about 1 million people uh, left Mexico and immigrated to the United States in, in hopes for better opportunities, um, economic, labor, and social opportunities. Um, and so as, as people are laboring in, in the railroad industry, uh, oftentimes, you know, they come, they're coming from my hometown of El Paso, Texas, to, um, to they're, they're on their way to Chicago, and they managed to stop in Kansas City. And little by little, uh, in the first decades of the 20th century, the Latino community is emerging as, you know, groups of single men who are working in these industries or families are fleeing the Mexican Revolution, are settling and uh, in areas like Armourdale, like Rosedale, like the West Side. Um, these communities were very segregated from the get-go, um, and um, and the, the outside Kansas City community, um, although these communities were flourishing, they had businesses and, and other spaces that catered to the needs of the, the Mexican community at the time. Um, outside of those neighborhoods, uh, Mexican and Mexican Americans found themselves uh, in segregated spaces, they found themselves discriminated against. Um, and so there needed to be uh, organizations and groups that needed to uh, help the, the newly arrived Mexican community navigate life in Kansas City in the United States. Um, so at the same time, uh, you have the reform movement happening and you have groups of affluent women, primarily white women, uh, who became uh, really interested in helping uh, immigrant groups. Um, and in Kansas City, you have the Amber Club, which was formed in 1916, and they primarily helped uh, Italian immigrants in the historic Northeast, and then Mexican, uh, Mexican immigrants in the West Side. Um, so they, they uh, collaborated with a, a father, a Catholic father in uh, the West Side, uh, his name is Father Munoz, and they set up the structure for what became the Guadalupe Center in 1919. Um, the Amber Club established um, a well baby clinic that was ran out of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church's uh, rectory, uh, and they also started uh, creating programs, uh, social programs uh, for the community there. They started holding uh, sewing classes, uh, cultural programming, uh, and night school to teach uh, English uh, for, for people uh, after they went into um, their jobs. The center, though, doesn't really flourish as much as it does until, uh, until Dorothy Gallagher, who is considered the godmother of the Guadalupe Centers, uh, comes into the picture. Um, so she joins the club and a few years later, she uh, in 1926, she becomes the director of the Guadalupe Centers. And under her uh, direction for 18 years, um, she works really hard and arduously without pay, they said, uh, to create a space for the Mexican community to be able to become Americanized, uh, but while also celebrating their Mexican heritage. So it is under her leadership that you have classes like home economics and vocational training. You have the emergence of sports teams. Uh, and you have the emergence of grand fiestas or you know cultural celebrations at the time. Um, and when she steps down 
uh, before she steps down, actually, she donates the money to build the Spanish colonial building um, during the Great Depression, right? Uh, in 1936, she donates the, the money to be able to build the Spanish colonial uh, building that the Guadalupe Center is housed in today. When Dorothy Gallagher steps away from the directorship um, in the mid 1940s, uh, the Catholic diocese, because this was started as a Catholic, uh, you know, group organization through the Ar Amber Club, the Catholic diocese takes over the organization. Um, and fast forward to uh, the 1960s and 70s, uh, you have the, the social movements of the time uh, picking up steam and um, Kansas City was also uh, witness to the Chicano movement locally. Um, so there was uh, there was activism uh, in the West Side, and so as a result, it also trickled into the Guadalupe centers, uh, where the community members uh, were advocating for the separation from the Guadalupe centers uh, uh, from the Catholic Church uh, in order to become self, you know, to pursue self determination and to become self sufficient and be able to control their own destinies. Um, and so after a very controversial conflict uh, in the 1970s, the Guadalupe Centers essentially uh, becomes independent from the Catholic Church. And even though those first years um, where they were separated from the church uh, were a little tumultuous, uh, that growth just enabled the organization to grow uh, to beyond any of the expectations of its original uh, of its original. Uh, mission. Um, so, you know, the Guadalupe Center still continues to have uh, social services uh, under the leadership of Chris Medina. It has expanded its cultural programs, its youth programs. Uh, it has even opened a credit union to help uh, Latino families uh, build up credit um, in order to, you know, be financially independent as, uh, as, you know, they're settling in the country or as, oftentimes banks had historically uh, denied, um, you know, financial help and, you know, even a bank account to many Latino families. Um, and lastly, I think one of the, the, the biggest reaches that the Guadalupe Center has had uh, since it's kind of indep like independence from the Catholic Church in the mid 70s is the, uh, the establishment of a pre-K through 12 charter school system that focuses on celebrating, uh, not only providing a better education opportunities for the Latino community, but also uh, in centering Latino history and Latino culture as part of the curriculum. Um, and then just to conclude with the story today, you know, what became, what was established and pretty much the rectory of a Catholic church in, the, in 1919, uh, it today is one of the largest uh, nonprofits in the area. It is the largest Latino uh, nonprofit in the region, and it still continues to have the legacy of being the longest continuously operating Latino organization in the United States. The next story uh, that I want to share is about an individual, but uh, I think that it connects to a lot of uh, of our current climate right now, um, especially uh, as it is an election year. Uh, but I, I wanted to share this story uh, as well because I think it's just very powerful. Um, so I'm sure that over the last you know years and decades, you've probably heard a lot of political pundits, a lot of journalists and other experts touting how uh, important the Latino vote is uh, for uh, for political candidates uh, and how we are waiting for the sleeping giant of the Latino community to take over, you know, the electoral decisions of the country. Um, so to put it into perspective, today there are 60 million people who identify as Latino and 32 million of the, of, of the 60 million are eligible to vote in the 2020 election, uh, which roughly comprises about 13% of all eligible voters, and it's the largest uh, minority block there as well. So uh, as uh, the demographics of Latinos are growing across the country, uh, you do have political candidates 
uh, connecting or attempting to connect to the Latino population, uh, attempting to understand issues that affect the group um, because they believe that in order to uh, to win the election, it is imperative to have the support of Latinos. Um, and despite this, uh, you know, demographic change, Latinos have historically and continue uh, to face a number of barriers to get to the ballot box um, and are not necessarily, um, their numbers are not necessarily reflected um, in the local, state, or national electoral politics. Um, so this fight for political representation brings the story that I want to talk about, uh, and one that highlights the uh, tireless efforts of a community activist by the name of Rafaela Lali del Ga uh, Garcia, excuse me. And this story was able to be documented. A lot of people know about her, but I don't think that we had the extensive um, story. Uh, and one of our students, Kelly Heidi, uh, she was able to interview her uh, as part of our ongoing uh, Profiles in Kansas City activism project. And um, she was able to interview her last year and she was able to capture her role in shaping Kansas City and Missouri politics. Um, so Garcia is, she was born in 1929 and she uh, grew up both in Armourdale, but most of her life was spent on the West side. Garcia credits her father, Ramon Reyes, to have fostered and encouraged her love for politics when she was a teenager. And when her father noticed that she had some interest in, in politics, uh, he began taking her to uh, political meetings at a local barber shop on Southwest Boulevard. Uh, Garcia was a teenager and she would go to these meetings and she would be surrounded by men, by older men, but, you know, like them, she shared their visions of Latino representation in City Hall and ensuring that the West Side had a political voice in local affairs. Uh, this informal group that met at the barber shop would later become a formal, uh, formalized group called the West Side Citizens Political Club. Um, and as part of this club, uh, they began hosting um, forums for local candidates. Um, they made sure that these candidates understood the concerns of the West Side. Um, and they also, um, you know, wanted to hear about proposed legislation, not only, you know, in uh, locally, but um, statewide. And the West Side Citizens Political Council arduously worked uh, to give pol a political voice and representation for Latinos in Kansas City for decades. Uh, and so as part of this group, Gar uh, Lali Garcia is in her late 20s and she gets to be asked uh, to become uh, the president of the club. Um, and she took the position with the encouragement of her father. And for years, you know, um, Garcia was the only woman in the political club. And when my student asked her, um, you know, if there were struggles uh, because she was a woman and she was surrounded by men, uh, she proudly stated that she just, you know, she did what she had to do and she set them in their place. That's a, that's a straight quote from her. Uh, but for decades, uh, this, this club and, you know, worked to give voice to the Latino community. Uh, and they, they, Great, got some great victories out of it. Um, in 1975, the club campaigned for Robert uh, Bobby Hernandez, who was running against a five-time incumbent at the time for city council, uh, and his name is Sal Capra. With the help of the club, uh, Hernandez defeated Capra by 500 votes and became the first Latino elected city council uh, man. Uh, Chris Medina, who is the CEO of the Guadalupe Centers and other community leaders um, often credit Lali uh, Garcia for launching the political careers of so many folks, uh, including Paul Rojas, who uh, also grew up in the West Side, uh, and he became the first Latino elected uh, to the Missouri State Legislature in 1972, um, and I, Pat Rios, uh, the first Latino to become elected to the Jackson County Legislature in 1974. In the 80s, uh, with the demographic changes um, in Kansas City, uh, the club voted to change the name of the group to be inclusive uh, and to be reflective of the changing demographics uh, of the Kansas City area. And so the group becomes formally known as La Raza, or the race, uh, you know, uh, political club. And Lali Garcia serves uh, as the president of the group from 1989 to the present day. 
Uh, in her roles as a president of this organization, uh, she travels, she's traveled to Jefferson City, to Washington, D.C. She's met with state and federal uh, representatives in order to uh, put the voices of the Latino community uh, at the forefront. And La Raza and uh, the influence of Lali Garcia has made this organization a key endorsement for politicians historically. Uh, La Raza, because it requires, uh, if, if uh, candidates would like to get an endorsement or would like to be considered for an endorsement for the organization, um, they have to present to come to the community uh, and present their ideas. Uh, and then the organization itself votes based on their perceptions and their knowledge of how they will support the Latino community. Um, and so you have candidates who are local candidates, who are county candidates, who are statewide candidates, who will seek this coveted endorsement uh, from, uh, from La Raza. Something that I myself witnessed last year at a mayoral forum during the election uh, last year. And it was just so fascinating to see that take place. Uh, Garcia has had a 70 plus year you know political activism career that has changed the social fabric of kansas city um, in 1991 she was a plaintiff in a federal lawsuit that was challenging uh the gerrymandering uh with the, the uh, gerrymandering with the intent of diluting the latino vote uh in kansas city uh, the case was finally settled in 1994 which left the uh, boundaries of the west side somewhat intact and in ensuring that the latino community had a voice uh, other politici or politicians, such as former mayors uh, Charles Wheeler and Richard Berkeley, uh, Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver, and even you know people who went on to national scale like Harry Truman, uh, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and Hillary Clinton have all benefited from the strong campaigning uh, and endorsements from Garcia and La Raza Club. Um, she also has helped uh, Funding for obtain funding for the West Side neighborhood, bringing street lights, street improvements, sidewalks, a community center, and has uh, and was a driving force in bringing the credit union to the Guadalupe Center to provide uh, financial services for the Latinos uh, in the community. Um, and so, Lali Garcia is 91 years young, and she is continues continuously working uh, to be politically and actively engaged in the community. Uh, she's also served on the board of the Guadalupe Centers, uh, has been a member of a variety of boards across the city, and also served in the Jackson County Human Relations Citizens Complaint Board, and among a variety of other groups. And so uh, while we may see these efforts uh, uh, of La Raza and La Liga Garcia as very local in scale. Uh, it is these local movements um, that essentially, uh, you know, bring about change uh, in our daily lives, right? And that then, you know, these local movements are the ones that build up that force uh, both state and federal entities to follow suit. So I think that that story um, and just ensuring that there's a political voice and representation for the Latino community uh, is so important because it can provide a great examples um, as we move forward and as, you know, the Latino population continues to still be underrepresented on the political uh, kind of stage um, in all, you know, in all entities of government. And the last story I want to conclude with uh, is more of a cultural celebration, but one that uh, we often don't process as being a a large, you know, part of the fabric of Kansas City uh, and one that has regional impact. Um, so this spring, uh, students who were enrolled in my oral history class uh, had the opportunity uh, to interview more than 20 community members uh, for the Lanx KC oral history project. And I have to say that I was very proud of my students um, who had to shift gears as, you know, the pandemic had a, you know, push everything onto hold. They managed to even conduct oral histories uh, through Zoom and through phone. So I was very proud of their dedication to the project. Um, and one of them, uh, one of these students, Kathleen Foster, uh, when she moved into the Kansas City area, 
one of the first events that she attended was Fiesta Hispana. And so she she wanted to know more about the uh, the the celebration um, and she decided to pursue uh, interviews with community leaders that were affiliated with with the organization and kicking off um, uh, the Latino Heritage, uh, Latino Heritage Month uh, here in Kansas City, uh, which has unfortunately uh, been canceled due to the pandemic. Uh, but uh, since the 18, uh, not 18, sorry, since the 1980s, uh, Fiesta Hispana has brought tens of thousands of people to the city to celebrate Latino uh, history and culture. So Fiesta Hispana can tie its, uh, its historical roots back to national history. Uh, in September, on September, uh, in September, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson proclaims uh, the first National uh, Hispanic Heritage Week. Uh, this week uh, is slated to start every September 15th, and the week would recognize the contributions uh, that Latinos have made to American society, uh, to American businesses, to education, et cetera, uh, through a number of activities and ceremonies. Uh, but it was not until 1988 that Congress uh, actually establishes National uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. In the early years of the establishment of the National uh, Hispanic Heritage Week, uh, Latinos uh, who were mostly uh, federal employees are the ones who are leading the commemoration in Kansas City. Uh, so you have in 1981, uh, Jose Gonzalez and Becky Jaramillo who were working for the Department of Housing and Urban Development at the time, as well as Nifa Garza who, also, who was working at the Guadalupe Centers, uh, they collectively organized um, the first Fiesta Hispana. Uh, so in the first years you have had simply a parade that would go from Armordale uh, and on the Kansas side to the west side, to the Missouri side. And it was just a parade that would go through Southwest Boulevard. And so the three of them envisioned an event after the parade that would just still collectively bring people and celebrate uh, Latino heritage at the time. And so, and then they also wanted to make sure that they were uh, celebrating the contributions to the local, uh, to Kansas City and the greater region and the Midwest in the United States. Um, and so by uh, 1983, uh, once they kind of organize an event that just is established at, um, at, at Southwest Boulevard, uh, they, bring, they managed to bring in thousands of people into the space, uh, which obviously is going to necessitate a larger, a larger space for the celebration. And so in, 19, in 1983, uh, Fiesta Hispana was recommended to move into the newly built uh, Barney Ellis Plaza uh, with the support of Bobby Hernandez, who was the, pers the first elected uh, Latino city councilman uh, in the city. Uh, and with his uh, support, uh, the group is able to move into downtown Kansas City. And so they also, the following year, uh, the three established the Greater Kansas City National Hispanic Heritage Committee uh, as a nonprofit to undertake uh, the planning and, and the fundraising for uh, Fiesta Hispana. And so this move downtown essentially uh, and the formation of, of the nonprofit organization then enables uh, the group to expand the celebration beyond their original uh, kind of vision. Uh, so for almost four decades, Fiesta Hispana is, has been a three-day celebration in downtown Kansas City that brings, has brought numerous uh, uh, musical acts and dancing acts uh, of national and international uh, renown uh, that are you know, celebrating Latino history. Uh, they also offer uh, over 75 booths that offer food, art, education, history, games, uh, health services, employment opportunities, and other activities for the whole family that just showcase and celebrates Latino culture here in Kansas City. Uh, and every year, uh, it is estimated that Fiesta Hispana brings anywhere between 30,000 to 40,000 people to the, to the event. Um, and these are, the attendees are not necessarily just people from the local community, but rather uh, from across the region, uh, officially making it the largest Latino event in the Midwest. So this influence and the scale of the celebration uh, 
has garnered uh, continuous support from city officials and businesses uh, as Fiesta Hispana has become an important uh, regional tourist event and attraction um, in the fall for Kansas City. Uh, but for the organizers of Fiesta Hispana, uh, the continued support of uh, not only from city officials, uh, but also from the attendees uh, just provides a glimpse of the importance of Latinos in Kansas City, uh, the Midwest, and that importance for representation and cultural celebration of this group um, across the region. I just want to conclude uh, kind of this brief presentation with, uh, with this message. Um, so, it is very important to ensure that there the that organizations scholars and you know everyone is striving to create historical inclusivity in uh, our histories in archives um, etc because um, erasing me, uh, these narratives and not having access to these narratives not knowing these narratives can potentially become you know not only are you undermining the history of a community uh, but it can potentially become dangerous uh, so I, I don't want to connect it to this, but, uh, you know, last year as, as a native from El Paso, Texas, um, I witnessed from afar uh, a tragic event that disassociated, you know, the history of the place, right, the history of Texas, uh, and it was deemed as a Hispanic invasion of the country, even though Latinos and Hispanics have had a long legacy uh, in living in El Paso and obviously all across the United States. Uh, so it, this, these types of projects, these types of efforts in celebrating and documenting the history of Latinos, the victories, the, the struggles, the fights, et cetera, is just so, it becomes such an important um, act of historical advocacy that, um, that just gives a glimpse uh, at the uh, long roots and legacies of Latinos in, in this country and how they have been just such an important fabric and, and piece of the fabric of our local, regional, and national communities. So uh, with that said, uh, you know, I just also, in my, in my teacher hat, I wanna say, you know, the census is, the deadline's coming up on the 30th of this month. And it's so important that, you know, that you and your family complete your census uh, because every, you know, we need to make sure that we have the demographics, you know, uh, established in every community so everyone can have access to the, the proper, you know, services and proper funds uh, in order for communities to thrive. And also as a selfish historian, it's so important to see these numbers as well, uh, to see the demographic changes in the country um, as, you know, as time goes by. So. Thank you uh, for hanging in with me today. And I'm really excited to take questions. Uh, if you have any questions or if you wanna share any stories through the comments, well, I'm open to that. Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question here. Um, what do you feel is the most common misconception about the Latino community in Kansas City? Um, I think that there's two common misconceptions. Uh, one, I think that everyone thinks that's a new arrival and that the transformation and the kind of visibility of, of the Latino community recently kind of talks to the, to the kind of, you know, immediate kind of roots, right, of, of the community itself and how they might be newer immigrant groups or newer migrant groups into the city. Um, and, you know, I had a student actually share with me uh, earlier last, it was last week, uh, that she has been here, you know, for generations and people to this day uh, still get surprised that she says, no, I'm like, you know, fourth generation Kansas Cityan. Uh, so that's one. Uh, and the second one, I think that one of the also, and I think this is a national misconception as well, uh, is that most Latinos are Mexican, right? And I know that it there's kind of like a long historical precedent to that because uh, Mexican, Mexican Americans have had obviously a long legacy of living in this country, um, you know, as 
people who lived in the in the Southwest, uh, and then you know, kind of moving uh, their citizenship in a way right, arbitrarily um, as part of you know conquest. Uh, but I think that even though Kansas City's population is mostly pr primarily Mexican American, um, that there are newer emerging groups. Um, that are you know not from from Mexico. You have a thriving Puerto Rican community here. Uh, you have a thriving Salvadorian community here. So I think that the diversity and the experiences of Latinos, uh, especially in in recent years, have just added so much more uh, nuance to the Latino experience here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. We have another question that came in. Uh, what scholars are familiar with the Jewish Latino experience? Hmm. I am now curious about this. I don't know of any off the top of my head, but if I ever, like if I think about something right now, uh, I will probably just go back and like comment on the comment section. But I'm not too sure. I think that there, I know about scholars who have kind of tracked down uh, like Jewish, Jewish experience in like Latin America, but I'm not um, too sure about um, in the United States. But I will be happy to share that with you once my brain is not fogged up and uh, also when I remember. So. All right. Well, if uh, there are additional questions, please type them into the comments and we'll make sure that here comes one. How does the way the census counts Latinos affect population growth estimates? This is a this is a great question. Um, I think that, well, because there's a misconception that obviously Latino is not a race, right? Um, and there are Latinos who might identify as white. Um, there are Latinos who identify as Black because they're Afro-Latinos. And so kind of like trying to fit in uh, into a particular box um, when you have an ethnicity, even though, you know, it, it's much more complicated than just saying like Latino and white, right? Or, let, or just even now we get the option of putting Latino, right? Um, in, the, in the census. But there are also folks who are, you know, they they have a biracial background, right? So I think that, or they might be, you know, part Mexican, part white, or part Puerto Rican, part black. And so I think that in in that, right, like we have to um, we have to see how the census can, and this is going to be a problem, I think, going forward for the whole country. How we can uh, how we kind of just want to put people into straight boxes because I think some of the uh, some Latinos, uh, even though they're they're already underrepresented groups, are already um, heavily undercounted in the census. Um, so that's one. And then two, uh, you might have people who also identify as Latino and something else in the like one or two more races, uh, you know, box. And so that kind of changes the the demographics as well. Again, if you have other questions, please type them into the comments. I have a question, Sandra. Um, interested in how your work with oral history and documenting these stories in face-to-face -face interviews with people in the community relates to your more traditional research methods of, of background research and archival research and, and other research that might be focused on, on documents, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I think that I mostly became an oral historian um, and a public historian was because I still couldn't find the stories that I, that I knew were there in the archives. So my, uh, in my traditional historic work, right, um, for my book, for example, uh, I am hodgepodging whatever I can. And I think that it just gives, you never have a complete, uh, a complete sense of the story. And I think that because, um, um, you know, traditionally we have, 
uh, as historians and public historians and archivists, we have not necessarily endeavored to document these stories. Uh, we have not, you know, picked up flyers and and other documentation from from these stories that oral history is probably the only way that we will get a glimpse at, of um, of a particular event or a particular period of time, especially with underrepresented groups. Um, but then I also like to add another kind of layer to that, uh, because you can, um, oral history brings much more than just the recovery of information. I think that you are able to gain perspective from people um, because they're coming, they're telling you their story um, in a way removed from that lived experience. So they've been able to process and think about how this particular event or time or place affected them. Um, but you're also able to get emotion. You're also able to get the humanity of people, something that you're not necessarily able to get from a traditional uh, document like a like a you know government document or a photograph right um and yes all you know all sources have their own biases and you have to look at them uh with a grain of salt and see like okay so what is it really trying to tell me uh but to me i think that the most um the most rewarding thing about oral history and being able to collaboratively create this record with another person um uh, is that I get to gain perspective on things that I would not necessarily be able to get from a traditional source. Like uh, in my own work, I am able to get, uh, you know, people have shared with me uh, how it felt to have your home demolished, how it felt that, you know, you were going to potentially lose the place that you were living in and why you you became active you know uh, so all these things um that you do not necessarily get from uh from records especially uh in documentation from underrepresented groups i think that oral history just provides this perfect avenue for you to uh to just be able to create this fantastic record um that is collaborative in nature, right? Um, and that just provides so much information that complicates even our studies as historians or as scholars. Mm -hmm. All right. A few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, can you suggest any ways or places in the KC area to educate children about Latino heritage? Yeah, so there are a few things that are online. Um, and I, like my, uh, my kind of, uh, my su biggest suggestion would be to take them to events. And I know that that's potentially not, you know, uh, the, the way to go right now. And there's, you know, there are a lot of events that, um, obviously are not taking place, but that would be my first and foremost, you know, take them to any of the amazing cultural events that, uh, you have, uh, throughout the year in Kansas city, right. Uh, and I think that seeing firsthand that celebration is so important, especially for um, for you know if you identify as Latino or Latina, uh, is so important. Um, and then there are other you know there are things that could be found you know online. Uh, they're you know very kind of you know hodgepodgey kind of placed together uh, stories uh, that could be accessible to people where you can kind of learn about these uh, particular histories in Kansas City. I know that there are a lot of organizations um, in uh, in the in the metro area too that are really pushing to have like an educational uh, kind of component to their work as well. Um, and then I was just gonna say uh, my last one. I know this is also potentially uh, kind of out of the ordinary, but there are some really great murals uh, across the metro. Uh, that, you know, depict the histories of Latinos in this, in the, you know, in the city, uh, in the metro, uh, one of them in Armourdale, it's this long, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to underestimate, it's like 50 or 100 foot long, you know, uh, history of Armourdale, um, and kind of like centering the Latino experience there. Um, I know it might not be like a complete uh, kind of story because it's not you know you don't have the words right you don't have the videos or you don't have you know a photograph but you can see the images and you can kind of explain that uh to children i think that um 
you know, th those are great places to start uh, to just share that that um, the history and legacy of Latinos um, here. Mm -hmm. The next question is somewhat related to the previous one uh, about ways to educate children about Latino heritage. But the question is about, is the centennial exhibit about the Guadalupe Center uh, still on display at the Kansas City Public Library? It is. Uh, I don't know. I still think that the, uh, the library is still closed. But uh, there is an online version of it um, that was also, you know, created at the same time as, as the physical exhibit. Uh, so if you want to access that, um, that um, exhibit, it's Guadalupe Centers 100.omeca.net. Uh, and I can share that also in the comment. And if, yeah. So I'll share with that with that, but you should be able to access it online. Yeah. So it's, it's the whole, you know, it's a whole, uh, uh, exhibit. And then I also forgot to say, uh, that, uh, Tico productions, um, also was one of the, the, uh, collaborators in the commemoration of the centennial for the Guadalupe center. And they created a documentary with kind of the long history of the Guadalupe centers. Um, and I have linked it in the Latinx KC uh, site, uh, mm -hmm. but they also have the videos on YouTube. They're just a little harder to find um, on YouTube, but mm -hmm. they're, they're there too as well. Mm -hmm. All right, and you mentioned the Latinx uh, project. Mm -hmm. Where Where is that? Uh, What's the future for the Latinx project? What, what are you working on now and, and where does it go? Yeah, and how and how do people access uh, yeah. the information? So the way that the, the Latinx uh, KC project works is a two, it's a kind of like a two-folded project. One, you know, uh, students and myself are, are doc like gathering world histories and, and, you know, connecting with members of the community. Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, I feel like the best oral histories are the oral histories of just everyday people that oftentimes uh, remove their daily lives from um, from being historical players, right? Like we're all being a part of history. We all have witnessed it, right? And I think that oftentimes people think, well, why do you want to talk to me? I have, uh, I have, uh, you know, no important history to share, but we all do. And I think that, you know, we're trying to document from you know, people who are, you know, politicians to activists, to artists, to just everyday people. And it's just, uh, in a way, I'm hoping that this archive becomes a just broad um, kind of archive of the Latino experience, right? Like the multifaceted, diverse Latino experience um, in the metro area. Um, the And so the, that's part one. And then part two is that uh, my students and I are working on this website um, that offers uh, snippets of the oral histories uh, with longer uh, essays uh, that connect the oral histories to particular themes. So uh, right now it lives under uh, the U uh, just info.umkc.edu backslash latinxkc, all latinxkc one word. Uh, but we're moving it into another uh, web platform uh, that is more conducive to being of, you know, of, of archiving videos and large content. Uh, so it will be migrated into the digital exhibits portion of the UMKC library. So that will be hopeful. So we're migrating uh, the, the info.umkc.edu uh, website into this other site. Um, and, you know, it, hopefully it'll be done by the, uh, before the, you know, before winter. Um, and obviously like I would still redirect people from this, uh, this site to the new site, mm -hmm. but yeah, you'll have, um, if you visit there, you'll be able to see a variety of, of stories, uh, and snippets from the oral histories, um, you know, uh, that, that the students have conducted and then the larger, uh, interviews. They're all mm -hmm. going to be archived at Labuddy Special Collections at UMKC. Great. 
Uh, we have one more question mm -hmm. that's come in. Have you heard many stories of the boxcar workers and their impact on Kansas City? I haven't heard a, like, you know, in-depth stories, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how a lot of folks established roots in Kansas City. Um, I've come across, I believe it was two photographs uh, that have been, um, they're archived at the Kansas State Historical Society. I'm not sure if they're digital, but I mean, you could see kind of the life, right? And, and living in the boxcars. And, and when I said uh, earlier, uh, you know, that Latinos in a way help build Kansas City, right? That's, it's a huge impact, right? Like folks were living in these boxcars because, um, um, because that's where they were laboring, right? And they couldn't, you know, they were kind of tied to their, to their labor um, and the economy of their labor as well. So a lot of folks, that's how they started setting roots in, in Kansas City. Um, and I just can't even begin to imagine what it was like to survive, you know, Kansas City winter in a boxcar. Um, it's just, uh, it's terrible to think about, but yeah. yeah. I know that other folks have, uh, um, there's not a lot uh, that has been like really written about, uh, like we don't have an extensive body of Latino history in Kansas City. Uh, so it's something that I'm hoping that with, uh, you know, the oral histories and all these other projects um, that kind of jumpstart some more research on the communities here. Uh, but I was, I think, uh, Valerie, Mar or, I forgot her, Mendoza, sorry, but Valerie Martinez is someone from Texas. Uh, but Valerie Mendoza, uh, she wrote a dissertation on the early ex uh, experiences of uh, of Mexican immigrants in Kansas City. Uh, so you might be able to get um, kind of like the larger picture um, and the larger stories mm -hmm. of, of uh, th those early communities. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks for being here, taking the time to share those stories and, and your research and tell us about this important aspect of the history and, and culture of Kansas City. Appreciate yeah, it. No, thank you for having me. And, you know, obviously this is not a, a conclusive history. There's just a very brief kind of like scratch at the surface at the very rich history of Latinos here in Kansas City. So I invite you, you know, to, uh, you know, in whichever way possible, learn more about the community and how just wonderful and rich this, these stories are um, and how they just connect to so many other stories and other people, even within uh, the Kansas City Metro. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of your afternoon, evening, so. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. So check in again for forthcoming programs related to the State of Stories initiative that we're uh, partnering with the University of Missouri Extension Community Arts Program uh, over the next year. So we look forward to seeing you here again. Thank you all and have a nice evening.